So when people say, I want to build a better culture, be yourself. You know, who are you? Be you. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick, Martial Arts Radio, episode 774. My guest today, Tashi Deb Mahoney. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where all the stuff we do is in support of traditional martial arts and traditional martial artists, people like you. If you want to see everything we've got going on, go to whistlekick.com. It's our online home. You're going to find a bunch of great stuff over there. And you'll also find all the stuff that we sell. That's right. We do sell some things, some stuff that you might be interested in, things from training programs to fun apparel, like this this hoodie I got on, to uh, events that we're putting on. There's a lot of great stuff over there. And if you use the code PODCAST15, it's going to save you 15% on any of the stuff that we have. Now, the show, Martial Arts Radio, gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, because we don't name things in a complex way. If you go over there, what are you going to find? You're going to find every episode we've ever done. You're going to find a ton of context for those episodes. Transcripts that you can search through or, or you know, copy and paste and read on your Kindle or something like that. You're going to find photos and videos that the guests submit or things related to things that we talk about on the episodes or even links to their social media, their websites or other topics of interest that may come out of that episode. While you're over there, you can sign up for our newsletter and stay up to date on everything that we've got going on as a company to support you, person that is a traditional martial artist. Now, the goal of the show, really Whistlekick in general, is to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists worldwide. And if you want to help us continue to do that, there are lots of things you could do. You could make a purchase. I already told you some of the things we've got going on over there. It's a constantly shifting mix. There's some great stuff over there. Protective equipment uh, that keeps going in and out because it's really popular and we order more and then it sells out. And then we order more and then that sells out. So it's it's kind of a, it's a fun problem to have. You could also tell a friend about this or maybe a different episode. The number one way that we grow is word of mouth. People telling other people, hey, have you checked out this whistle kit company and the stuff they're doing? I really like what they stand for or whatever it is you want to say to them. Or you could join our Patreon, patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. You can get in as little as two bucks a month. Price goes up for there. Our top tier is $100 a month. And at each tier, we give you overwhelming value. How do I know it's overwhelming value? Because people don't stop. People don't quit their Patreon. It just constantly grows because we make sure it does because we have some say in that by giving you great stuff. At two bucks a month, you're going to get some behind the scenes. You're going to get to know who's coming up on the show. At upper tiers, you're getting bonus audio and video episodes. If you like this show and you want more, well, this is the easiest way to get more. Uh, at the top two tiers, you get access to our school owners mastermind. There is no better way for you to grow your school than to join in with this really tight knit, open, very smart group of successful martial arts schools. And let's not forget it becomes a business right off at that point. So why, why not? Why would you not do that? And our biggest fans know that we have a family page, the whistlekick.com slash family page. You got to type it in and we update it at least weekly with behind the scenes, again, exclusive stuff. We don't repeat the same stuff everywhere to give you more context, more value to what whistlekick is and who we are and enhance your understanding of being part of our family. So there we are. Now, today's episode with Tashi Deb Mahoney, I've had the pleasure of getting to know Tashi Deb over the last couple of years. She's a wonderful, wonderful person. And we sat down to talk. Now, we didn't really know what we were going to talk about because, let's face it, I rarely know what I'm going to talk about with guests. We just see what happens. But we ended up in some really interesting, kind of deep philosophical locations. And if you know anything about me, you know I love going into those areas, those sometimes dark corners of martial arts conversation. And I won't say we got into anything dark, but we did get into some stuff that isn't discussed very often. And I had a blast doing it. I think you'll have a blast listening. And here we go. How are you, Deb? Good. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. This is great. Yeah, this is, this will be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Looking for fun. Good. Should we dive in? Oh, we we should dive in. Let's dive in. Let's dive in. Absolutely. So let's, I know you like a little bit. A little bit, yeah. You know, just enough that I think it's going to help me ask some questions. Okay. So let's start here. I know, if I remember correctly, you started as an adult. I and did. I always And I always find those 
stories, those kind of Genesis stories, really interesting because the whys are so compelling. Mm-hmm. So let, let's yeah. start there. Sure. Why did you start training? Okay. Well, um, I think it's a very typical story. I mean, it happens okay. to everybody. Um, my five-year-old son mm. wanted to be a Ninja Turtle. What does it want I to mean, be a Ninja Turtle? I mean, hey, you know, so how can you help me, Mom? I want to be a Ninja Turtle. And I said, yeah. oh, no, you don't, sweetheart. No, no, you don't. So he said, yeah, I do. Now, I was 35 at the time. I had Shane was five, and then Darby was a year old. And I said, look, look, hon, you know, he, he wanted to do karate, karate, not karate, you know, karate. I'm going to do karate. I said, okay. I knew nothing about it. We had horses. I said, mm. honey, why don't you take lessons? I'll give you lessons. Or are you, whoops. I said, why don't you go to a stable and mm. take some lessons? We've got the horses. Right. And it was like, we have horses. I said, yeah, those things in the backyard, you know, the horses. And I didn't want to do that. I said, how about tennis? Tennis is great. You know, I mean, it's fairly safe. You know, I might get hit in the head with face with a ball or something. It was pretty safe. No. Swimming. No. Thinking of all these things. He had already tried as a three and a half year old or so. He had tried the little hockey thing. You no know, mm-hmm. skating. That did not go so well because he mm-hmm. said, why are these people trying to knock me over? I said, well, because that's part of it. They kind of, you know, he says, no, no, so that wasn't for him. So I said, all right, look, uh, so you want to do um, karate. Hmm. All right, there's a place in Ipswich. I, I've seen it. We drive by there. My uncle lived down the street. You know, I said, that's the only thing I knew. Now, this was in 87, mm. I think it was, 86, 87. And, you know, th- there was that one school. And I said, all right, I'll make an appointment. You know, I'll give a call, make an appointment. So I did. So I took him over there. I walked in and, and the instructor was very nice. You know, he was just, you can tell when someone, you know, cares right away, looks mm. you in the eye and it was very nice and everything. And I said, and I'm kind of going like this to him, like, no, I don't want him to do this. I don't want him to do this. So, you know, I'm winking, going like, I'll slip you some bucks under the table if you say, you know, this isn't for you, you know, because what did I think at that time? I knew nothing about it. It's what people, many people still think today. You're fighting. You're going to go in there. You're going to learn how to punch somebody in the face. You're going to learn how to kick them. You know, that's what they think. And that's what I thought. Yeah. So we started that journey. We went in, and of course, he still was all, <laughs> you know, I'd be a Ninja Turtle. Uh, and, and the fellow was. Because a five year old is not turned off by violence. Oh, no, not at all. Five year old thinks tried, violence is the best. It's that's that's kind of the nature of the beast yeah. at that age. And it's it's normal, you know. Um, so we started. I said, okay, you can do this. You can try it. So I think we signed up for a trial or something. It was so long ago. I can't remember mm. how we did it. And, um, he started training and I started watching and I'm like, Hmm, Oh, this looks, this is interesting. You know, cause I thought it was just all punching and kicking. And this instructor was very good because he would explain and he'd say, now remember, you know, that you have to use it appropriately. Da, da, da. These are little mm. five and six year old kids. And I watched for about six months and he, the instructor was saying, Hey, you know, you seem kind of interested in it. You should try it. And I said, well, I'm pretty busy. You know, I've got my horses, I've, I'm working, I do this and that. And, But the whole time he says, well, you're here anyway. So, you know, you could take a class after, do this or whatever. So he was trying to make it work for me. Yeah. And I thought, well, maybe if I can get reinforcements. So there was another another mother whose son was in that class, same age. The kid was the same age. I said, Donna, Donna, would you like to do this? And she goes, I don't know. I never thought about doing something like this. You know, I thought it was just for just for kids. And Mm -hmm. so many people think that. Then there was I had another friend. Uh, that I taught with, you know, in the elementary school. And I had mentioned something to her and she said, you know, I've always wanted to do that. Mm. I said, Ellen, really? You wanted to do karate? And she said, yes. So the three of us ganged up on the instructor and said, if we can stand in the back, you know, just leave us alone. Let us stand in the back. We're going to give it a try. And he says, of course, yeah, you can stand in the back. So we stood in the back and you know, we've talked a few times, Jeremy, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty um, social and yeah. I, you know, I express myself quite I'd well. I certainly agree with that. There you go. Well, back then, but back then I was very shy and oh, I did not have, and I think the shyness came about, I didn't have confidence in my physical abilities. Mm. 
you know, I, I was uncoordinated. I got kicked out of ballet when I was like five. You know, the woman said, forget it. <laughs> you know, she's not going to make it. <laughs> so I didn't even like it. But anyway, you know, I wasn't coordinated. Basketball was a challenge, you know, trying to run and bounce that ball at the same time. I mean, all those things. I did ride horses. I started when I was 10 and I did quite well with that. Which is not easy as someone who, you know, I, I could hop on a horse and feel yeah. adequate somewhat yeah. with, with the experience that I've yeah. had. It's not it's not easy. So I, I think that's much more complicated than getting a ball to go where you want it to go. Yeah. Well, the horse has a <laughs> well, mind of its own yeah. and you had can to make work decisions. It out. Yeah. But it ta- it taught me so much because you have to compromise and you have mm. to work with a, a living creature. So it's not like, you know, you have to, to survive. And I mean, I had crazy horses, so I'd be on the ground more than I was on the saddle sometimes, but I still didn't have the feeling that I was coordinated enough to do it. Mm. You know, I'd see people, you know, punching with one hand, kicking with the other, doing this and that. I'm thinking, oh man, I'm never going to be able to do that. You know, I could sit on that horse. I could feel him. I could do dressage. I could do, you know, uh, three-day eventing. I could do all this, but I always thought it was the horse that was doing it, you know, more so than I, you sure. know, giving me, give me a good horse and I'm, I'm all, all set. So I started training and um, Shane continued to train. And I really thought, wow, this is a lot more than it seems, you know, on the, on the outside. I mean, I started to discover things about myself, like I can do that. I can, and I'm pretty strong. And, you know, all those things that, you know, kind of came to light. So to make a long story short in this part of the, the uh, interview, um, the other two dropped out. I think they might have gotten to Purple Belt, maybe. Something like okay, that. so they, they lasted a little while. They it wasn't just a, a week while. or two. They lasted yeah. a little while and they enjoyed it. You know, it's okay. just that I don't think they were getting the same internal feeling that I was getting. Mm. You know, when we talked about it or something like that, it was like, oh, this is something to do. Yeah, I work up a sweat. I feel a little stronger. But I don't think they had the same feeling that I had that was almost a spiritual kind of thing, mm. you know. Um, and so I did continue. Well, that instructor left that particular location. So we ended up going and I tried the new instructor that came in. And like so many, you know, so many things in life, you have great instructors and you have some that are nice people. But I think he was pushed into this role before he was ready. Yeah. And he started to teach me like kata five when I was working on kata two. And I'm like, I'm so confused, <laughs> you know, and, and he, he just, he was not confident. Sure. And I, so I, we left and went to another location. The school had another location that was actually closer to our house, but I hadn't known about it at the time and um, continued training. So that's how I began. Okay. And I could tell you about a little bit about the journey. Um, well, there's a part of the journey I, I want to go to because you, you hit on something that you didn't use this wording, but I think it's really important. Essentially, you found a why pretty early. You know, mm-hmm. your original why was this is interesting. You were subjected mm-hmm. to it. This mm-hmm. this is my mother's origin story as well. She watched me train right. for <laughs> a couple of years and then she said, I'm going to give this a shot. And she, if I remember correctly, just as you joined with a few other moms. Mm-hmm that mm-hmm. we're watching, right? So there was that internal support group. Yeah. But you found something fairly quickly yeah. that changed your why that the others did not. Mm-hmm. And it becomes really clear when we look back over time in hindsight, but it sounds like you were pretty aware of it in the moment. And I'm curious if if you can bring us back to that time and talk about mm-hmm. what discovering that, that growth that, hey, I, I am... I'm kind of strong. Hey, I I can do this. Mm -hmm. What that discovery process felt like as it unfolded? Well, as, as it unfolded, I mean, I, it didn't happen obviously overnight. Sure. Um, But I began to see how my training at the dojo affected other aspects of my life. And all of a sudden, you know, I did ski. Mm -hmm. So, wow, my skiing, I'm, I'm more, I was more confident. You know, I thought, okay, if I can, if I can spar, if I can stand up to someone that's trying to, to nail me, I can, I can handle this black diamond. <laughs> you know, sometimes it wasn't such a great idea, but, um, you know, so it gave me confidence in other areas. Mm-hmm. And I think that's how I started to see it. I thought, what's different this year? 
Why am I, you know, able to do things that I was not physically able to do before? Yeah. So that was like the physical part. And of course, my riding, it, it affected everything, really, mm-hmm. because, you know, in our training, we used both. I was severely right handed. I was so dominant that, you know, left hand, I look at it and go, do you belong to me? Oh, hi there. You know, so now think about riding a horse. You've got two reins, you know, skiing. You've got two skis. All these things started to get better. Mm. And, and more comfortable. And I was just more confident. I could take more risks in what I was doing. Okay. It's harder to explain the emotional part. I think what started to happen is you work with people on a certain level and you have to trust them. And so you start to kind of build relationships with other people that maybe normally you wouldn't have built. Sure. And anytime you have relationships, you grow. You know, you grow in understanding other people and where they're coming from and all that kind of stuff. And one of the biggest things I noticed was I taught school. I started when I in 1974 and I retired in 2011. And I taught all the way through. Even I had my kids, you know, I'd take a couple months off, you know, to pop out a baby and then, you know, go back to work. And I could stand in front now, not just in front of my class, because I was comfortable after a few, you know, after a couple of years, first years are rocky. Any teacher would tell you that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're, you're not really confident. Um, but after a while, it was like I could stand in front of any group. So I started to do things. I became a mentor, mentor trainer for the state of Massachusetts. I did things that shy little me before I started training wouldn't have thought I could do. Mm. And I and it just so. I can't explain it perfectly, but I know that it changed me and changed how I looked at things and, and what I could do. Mm. What what I, what I find really interesting about what you're saying is the fact that you are an educator and thus Mm -hmm. educated in education. And even with that context and that background and, and, if I did the math right, you know, 35 years of experience teaching right. in public schools. I mean, I, I, I don't even know what the math would be on how many kids you worked with over that time. I, it's, it's a I'm huge number. <laughs> and so when, when we take all of that, for you to still be able to point to martial arts training and say, there's something here that almost defies what we are generally taught and associate mm-hmm. with education and, and uh, development mm-hmm. and maturing yeah anybody who's been training for you know more than five or six years some who've trained much less see exactly what we're talking about we know we, we're all, most of us are on the same page about this but anytime i get to talk to an educator someone who has a different lens onto what's mm-hmm. going on i always find it interesting because it, it it should be should be right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Easy for you to say, oh, well, it's just this, but it's, it's not it's just, <laughs> there's no just here. And, you know, we can speculate, we can have theory and, and, and I've got my ideas on, I'm sure you have your own ideas mm-hmm. on it. And everybody listening probably have your own ideas on it too. But the fact is, whatever the reason may be, it works. There's something mm-hmm. here mm-hmm. and remaining persistent, mm-hmm. showing up leads to some pretty awesome stuff. Yeah. It sure does. And, you know, I've, I've tried to um, reflect and analyze and say, well, what is different about, because I, obviously, you know, I teach, I've been teaching um, martial arts since I was a, I think I was a green belt when I started teaching, you know, helping sure. with classes. And so um, I've been doing that. And I'm thinking, what is different about what we do in a dojo, dojang, wherever you, you know, wherever you are, what, what is different? And then we look at public or and or private schools and homeschooling. What what is different? And I have some ideas, but I think it's more complex. I think it's I used to think that perhaps it's because of the innate, the respect that you really push the idea of respect. And when you're in the public school setting, you I mean, I did that in my classroom. You know, we did a lot of um responsible classroom kinds of activities and things like that. And to, you know, we respect each other, we respect our differences and things like that. But there's something about the training and is it respect? Is it, is it, I don't know, uh, the goal setting, maybe the, the, 
the belt levels, although it shouldn't be. I, I never cared about my own, you know, that for me. Um, but I don't know what the answer is. I would love to hear from other people and say, you know, other, other, other educators perhaps that are training. And we have a lot here. Mark and I were talking earlier. And I mean, half the adult class are their teachers. Oh, high interesting. School, oh, yeah. High school, elementary. Okay. Um, we've ha- we had a nursery school. You know, we have, they're, they're, they're educators. And I think maybe I could, you know, pull them and say, I want you to step back and say, what, what is different? Mm. Um, many of them have the chil- their children go here too. So um, all I know is when I sat around those, those meetings at school, and I've even done it, I've advocated for children um, post-retirement um, and gone to different schools and sat on, on the, at the table. When everyone gets together and you have the psychologist and the psychiatrist and the, you know, the OT and PT, and, and they, they say, have you considered martial arts for your child? So they know yeah. what, what it does if you're committed and you stay. But why? What is it? My, I don't know that I've ever been asked this question and I don't know that I've ever really thought about it mm-hmm. because school, elementary, high school, college, wasn't like the academic side of it wasn't overly challenging for me, right? And so mm-hmm. when you end up doing well in a thing, mm-hmm. you don't tend to ask those questions. Right. If I had been ex- exceptional in college and, you know, Sheldon Cooper and yeah, moved yeah. up and everything, right? Maybe their questions would have been there. If I had been on the other end of the spectrum, there certainly would have been questions asked. But I think more than anything, what's coming to mind is the way we train, learn, and teach martial arts is fairly innate. It's experiential. It's done mm-hmm. in groups, but the the progress is individualized. There are clearly defined boundaries and goals, as you said, mm-hmm. And we understand not only where we are, but where we're headed generally. Mm-hmm. There, things are allowed to take the time that they need to take. I think that know, might be one of the keys. Uh, it, unlike pretty much every other academic setting where it's arranged in Let's go, nine yep. or 12 months <laughs> increments, <laughs> right? If you, get, if you master the material in four months, well, you get to burn the next five and take mm-hmm. the summer off. Mm-hmm. If... Mm-hmm something takes you longer, well, that's not acceptable. And now you're remedial and you're pretty much doomed for the rest of your life because of just the institutionalized language it's going to be used Mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas, heck, I mean, not that it happens often, but you see people who move quickly through certain ranks because things just click or they come in with a certain physical awareness. And it, I I think beyond that, I think we could look at the way martial arts is done and say in many, perhaps even most schools, there's something very natural about that educational process. Mm -hmm. And when, when I think of the way school is done even more so today, it's, it looks like how, what can we strip away and still Mm -hmm. have some progress and then verify the progress is being made. Right. Well, that's it. That's the you, you need to um, have dipstick um, assessments and things like that, so that you can make sure that you know the progress is being made. Right. Um, and, and I'm talking to friends now. You know, I'm, I'm 43. I have plenty of friends with kids and, and yeah. in, in, in different ages, and I'm hearing from not just one or two of them that some of their academic the, their children's academic assessments are showing regression through the mm-hmm. course of a year. Mm-hmm. That's that's bad. <laughs> right. And and if it was one person say, OK, you know, maybe it's that kid's teacher or maybe it's that kid, mm-hmm. maybe something going on at home. Or right? it's mm-hmm. it's pretty easy to dismiss. Mm-hmm. But I'm hearing about this as, as more than just one offs. And yet I can't think of a time when I saw someone consistently show up to a martial arts school and they got worse. I- and got worse. Yeah, exactly. At the very <laughs> least, they stay static. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But if they show up and they're they're having at least some fun somewhere, they're going to progress in something. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know if the answer or one of the answers would be um, trying to incorporate some of the Eastern thought and training into mm. Western education. Um, I would love to see martial arts taught in every elementary school, you know, right from kindergarten, pre-K, whatever. Um, oh, but it's going to make do, them violent. 
Well, yeah, exactly. Oh, I'll tell you. I mean, I did do that in my classroom. I mean, I don't know if that would be an answer for these particular kids who are regressing, but I have a feeling that if they are regressing, they're not engaged. They're not engaged in the process yeah. and they see no need to be engaged. They don't have, there's no goals there. There's not, it's like, okay, so I flunk a test, whatever. And, you know, I think what happens is they're pushed on to the next grade anyway, and they know that. And it's like, so why do I have to, why study? Why do this, you know? Right. But I think if we took some of the, and this was what, after I got my master's, I did classes in brain development. Um, I was very fascinated with that mm. and, uh, you know, things like that. But I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to matriculate for my, for my doctoral degree in incorporating Eastern thought into mm. Western education. And I had, you know, I, I did some courses and I kind of thought, okay, that means I really need to go to China and spend a couple of years there. I don't think that's going to work right now. <laughs> um, so I didn't, I didn't see it through, but I'm thinking that we have something, we are fortunate to have something that really helps people understand who they are, what they can do. And, and they're excited about it. Mm. And if we can, bring that into the classroom, which I did honestly try to do in my classrooms. And as I said, I taught, I taught them some simple techniques and things like that for self-defense um, with parents' permission. Sure. Um, I did have one uh, experience. Um, let's see, I, I was probably in the 90s and I was doing a multi-age classroom. That was my thing. I started multi-age, which was first hmm. and second or second and third. And uh, one of the students, wonderful kid, F fabulous artist, just a real sweetheart. It was the open house night, you know, that you have at the beginning of the year. And first we go down to the cafeteria, they introduce all the teachers, da, da, da. The principal gives a little chit chat and then you go back to the classroom and do your thing, right? So I was leaving the, the cafeteria, the auditorium and going back to the classroom and I was accosted I, uh, by this gentleman. He stood up in front of me and this is coming off of something that you said. And he's, you know, kind of a big guy. And he kind of stood in front of me and he goes, you, you. And I point this finger at me and I'm going like, I'm looking around like me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And there were a lot of other people and parents around me. He says, you teach violence. Now I hadn't done anything in the classroom with martial arts yet. It was early in the year. I hadn't done anything, mm. but he, I was teaching outside of the school, you know, at the mm -hmm. dojo, you teach violence, you teach people how to kill each other and he's yelling and screaming at me and I'm going whoa 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 you know you have the wrong idea and he was vehement and he was a minister didn't have a church um but um you know it was a very interesting and I was like there we go again no we don't we teach people how not to fight how how to how to understand how to to, to get out of situations um, things like that, but he wasn't listening and he was yelling. And finally, I think the principal came or something and hauled him away. Um, but that was, and then, you know, I had the child for the rest of the year and I actually ended up having his brother and things, I mean, it, it seemed fine. So I don't know. He just had, but that's what you said, you know, you, when you brought up it's violence and so many people still believe that. Yeah. And yeah, uh, there, there's a, there's a perception that I think very few in the martial arts space would hold, but a sizable percentage of the general population does that if you remove the capacity or the the discussion of violence, the training of violence, that violence fails to exist. Mm -hmm. And yet that's not what what does look at look at every animal when they're mm -hmm. young, mm -hmm. how do they learn about the world? They're mm -hmm. violent with their siblings. Absolutely. Look at the tiger it, cubs playing when they're they're babes. It, it's, you know, and yeah. They're just yeah, the only reason not it's violent. not violent is because they're not strong enough to be right. violent yet. <laughs> they have little milk teeth, though. They're not going to rip each other apart. And young uh, human children do the same thing. They, anybody who's had at least two kids knows that yep. at some point those kids will beat on each other. It yeah, is, they do. <laughs> it, is, it is natural. You can't remove it. So if we can't remove it, can we put it in context? Can we... Mm -hmm. gain some understanding? Can we gain some uh, autonomy over it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that is an issue with, um, I know on our test paperwork, that graduation paperwork we give out, there's a uh, half of it is for the classroom teacher to fill out, mm -hmm. you know, and asking how they're doing in school and da, da, da. And the bottom half has one, um, has three questions on it. But one of the questions is, does this student use martial arts outside of the, the dojo outside of and right now we are going through a case where one of the students is actually physically 
punching or hitting his mother. Mm. And that's a very difficult thing because it's not, and she's afraid that it's because he's learning how to do a proper punch or how to throw a proper kick or block or, you know, that he's learning it here. Um, and it's not, I mean, in my Maybe. mind, it's not that he's, learned. he would be hitting her anyway. If he's that, that, that would be my, and he has that, he would be hitting her anyway. It's yeah. not, it's not that. But she has that paperwork and we have ways of, okay, you don't graduate. You know, you right. get a bad comment on here. How, how old is the child? If you don't he mind. He is, is he nine? Okay. Eight? Eight. I think he's eight. But he's a good set. You know, he's, he's kind of husky. Good, mm-hmm. good build on him. So we're working with that now. Um, and she's very receptive and she's very responsive and sure. she's actually training also. So okay. this is a good thing that they're both, you know, that he's doing it and I'm sure we can help. Um, but, um, it, that's not usual. You know, we don't normally see that. Right. And anybody who runs a school, anybody who's spent a bunch of time knows that, yes, it, it is entirely possible that you have some people with violent tendencies for whom the violent tendencies are not. Um, diluted or diffused through their training. Now they do have some better tools. Right. But if you put them on one side of a balance and you put everybody else who benefits on the other side of the balance, right. Right. it's pretty overwhelming. True. It's it's True. it's not even close. True. I would rather have one person, one violent person out there who doesn't break their hand when they punch me. Right. Right. Versus, you know, the hundreds to thousands on the other side of the scale right. Right. who are True. that much less likely to get into or create problems. Right. Right. No, it's really, you know, it's an unusual or a case mm. or not unusual, but it's rare. It's you don't usually. Yeah. You don't usually see this. Um, but the nice thing is, is that we have a community as every school has, we, mm-hmm. where we hope Um where they can feel safe coming here, telling us. I mean, how many times have I been in this office um, talking with a distraught mom who just found out her husband said, I want a divorce? Mm. Or, you know, these these really, really life-changing things. But they come to us because they know we can we can support them and sure. we can support the family. And I think that's part of what I, going way back to the beginning of our conversation, that's something I started to realize. Well, this is different from going to art class. I like to paint, you know, going to art class or doing this or that because we were developing this, these relationships to support one another and trust. Mm. Um, so, you know, well, let's, she, let's, let's know talk about that, that for a moment. You know, it, uh, or, no, building those relationships and, and mm-hmm. that, that culture, I'm going to sum it up as culture mm-hmm. yeah. because as someone, if you had 35 years of public school teaching, you had 35 years, not only opportunities, but requirements right. to build a culture. And, and I would imagine it's a little bit easier if you're doing multi-year classrooms because you end up with a little bit institutionalized and you can right. bring them in. And now, you know, Have you've got work. some role models for them. Right. But you've seen a lot of that. And I think a lot mm-hmm. of martial arts schools either would like to improve their culture, culture or they have no idea how they got the culture that they have. And so they're nervous about replicating mm-hmm. it. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that and how oh, I do? And I think, look at that? I do think that my career helped me understand how to build culture mm-hmm. and how, and you need to build it. You can't just let it happen. You need to build it and you build it by, by being the best role model you can be by you know, encouraging and collaboration, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I wasn't the didactic. It wasn't like you do this, you do that. You know, I mean, obviously if somebody was being physically inappropriate or something, I would, of course, but it was like, all right, we had our meetings every morning, you know, let's sit down, let's talk about what's going to happen today. Who needs to share something? What you have some issues, you know, you build that community. And, and I, I have, I was in a martial arts school. I happened to be the first one. And I have to say this is that I left there many evenings crying. Hmm. You might say, well, why were you crying, Jeremy? Uh, what? Why were you why, crying? Why, why were you crying, Deb? <laughs> and it was because the, the zeitgeist, the ambient, the, the culture was negative. Hmm. I'd go in 
full of hopes and, you know, ooh, maybe I'll get another move on my form today and I wonder what's going to happen. And many times that didn't happen because I would do my form up to where I had or something and the instructor who I really never saw do too much would stand up the, well, you know, I mean, stand up at the front and he'd go, meh, meh. And I, that meant no, lousy, bad. So I, I remember learning this one form and I think it was at the time a, a first degree black belt. It might've even been second. I don't know, but I was learning this form and I, there was one move in it. And I think I did that one move for six months before they would allow me or he would allow me to move on. And I would leave thinking, what's wrong? So I went to another instructor that came in frequently and you may even know this person. I'm not going to do a lot of name dropping. Nope, quite but, all right. Um, this person came in and he's a real nice guy and he would take classes once. He would teach the classes once in a while. And he said, I went into his office and I said, look, I, I think I'm going to quit. Hmm. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm leaving here frustrated. I don't know how to improve. I don't know what to do. And he looked at me and he says, Hey, I'm going to teach you a Kung Fu form. We didn't do a lot of Kung Fu. He got out a soft staff, you know, a staff brought me on the floor and said, let's go. I said, really, really? You're going to teach me. This is great. He, so he knew. And, and, and by doing that, I started learning that form and and he was explaining it and it was like, you know, we'd laugh and da, da, da. I thought, okay, I guess I, I can do this. So that got me over that hump. So I kept going back because I said, I'm not going to let them um, stop my journey because I knew that the content, so a lot of the content was good, I thought at that time. Um, and it was just that I have to look past this negativity. So when we go back to developing a culture in the school, I think every school owner, every instructor needs to step back and say, are my students at the end of the class smiling, sweaty, happy, chit-chatting? How are they leaving? And I mean everyone, the, maybe the shy one that's in the car. You've got to make sure you look, you know, and you t touch base with that person and you say, hey, I noticed your kicks are really, really coming, coming up. I can't believe, you know, something something that you've noticed and you build the culture and you introduce people to one another. You know, you say, um, you know, Sammy, you have such great stances. Um, Jen, would you like to work with Sammy for a while? And, and, and then they start doing, and they start talking. And then before you know it, they're saying, let's go out for coffee. Or if it's a little kid, you know, can you come to my house today? I'll ask my mommy. Um, so, it's very tough. It's very time consuming and you have to stay on top of it. And it doesn't matter if you're having a bad day, you got to leave that bad day behind right. and you leave it in the office or you leave it in your car. Well, I don't know where you leave it, but you come on and you smile. Even when you answer the phone, you smile because that's going to, so you're setting the example of this. It's a happy place. Mm -hmm. It's a place to support everybody. And I th hope that happens more than not in most schools. You would know more about that because you visit. I, I, I think it does because I think the, the other way, the, the, the instructor who stands up at the front, meh, meh, which, you know, that, that exists, but not, not for long. And they never have a large number of students. The students that right. those schools right. tend to retain, frankly, are people that don't like themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they're getting this external validation that there's something wrong there's with wrong them. With them. Yeah. Whereas the other way you're talking about it is it's about it's about progress, it's about growth, it's about loving the training, whatever you want to call it. If if you can feel good about what you're doing, and if as the instructor you can feel good about what your students are doing, the other stuff tends to fall into place. Yeah, yeah. And you build that, so you have that nice. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I want I want my students to come through the door as they do. You know, the door whips open and, Hi, you know, and they, they run in, you know, the shoes fly off. You know, that's it's a what place want. they want to be, not a place they, they have to, to be, be there. Um, we did have, I'm thinking of a student, a teenager um, that we had who didn't want to be here. Hmm. Sister's still here and he and she's loving it, but hmm. he didn't. And I would and my heart was I said, honey, you don't want to be here. Tell dad and mom 
you know, this isn't, it's, it, maybe it's not for everybody. I know we could have done a lot with him, mm-hmm. but if he's not going to be invested, it's better. So finally they let him, they let him do something else, you know, to, yeah. to drop out. He, yeah. and, and I look at that and I say, it's not that it wasn't necessarily martial arts was bad for him or not good for him. Maybe, maybe your particular school wasn't quite the right fit. Yeah. You know, you can find a shirt on the rack and say, I like this shirt. And it just doesn't, you know, it it, it <laughs> kind of cuts you wrong and you like the shirt. Maybe even looks good on, but it just doesn't feel right. Maybe another mm-hmm. school would be better. Or maybe he just wasn't ready. Maybe there that, was stuff going well on be. where he needed to get to a certain point before he was ready. And and I've I've always said when when someone doesn't want to train, when they like just adamantly are not enjoying their time. Let them stop because otherwise they're going to build a negative association and they're unlikely right. to go back. Right. That's true for them. And it also affects the other students. Yes. You know, and greatly because I know when he was, you know, he'd be kind of moping and mm-hmm. uh, and the others were having a great time and they, you could see them question like, geez, I'm enjoying this. So what's up? You know, and they, right. they kind of think, am I wrong <laughs> for enjoying this? Um, so there was definitely... I think it's better just to, to, on a good note, and just say, hey, you gave it a good shot. Might not be for you. Try something else. Um, we're here if you, you know, decide right. to come back or try another place. And yeah. we do, you know, when people come to us, I, uh, and, I, and I don't think this is true of all schools, most perhaps, but when people come to us or call or email or whatever, and they say, I'm looking for a Taekwondo school. Uh, do you teach Taekwondo? Uh, no, we don't. Would you like us to help you find a Taekwondo school? Oh, would you do that? Sure. Let's, let, we know some in the area. Let's see what, because if they think that that's what they want, now they might think they want Taekwondo, but come to us and start doing Kung Fu and realize and think this is fabulous. Mm-hmm. But we're not going to push and say, well, come in anyway. Let's see, you know, because I feel if they're that strong about, you know, wanting a specific thing. So we try to find and do that. And they say, oh, well, thank you so much for helping. You know, it's not about, you know, pulling in everybody. You have to be kind of, and that's something I've been thinking about too, is when you have that first meeting, particularly with parents and they bring in a three-year-old, um, which is fine because we do have a great mm-hmm. little class. I mean, my granddaughter's in it and, you know, we have fun. They bring them in and, they don't really know what they want for their day. They, they'll put down at the bottom and say to have fun. And that's, that's great. But they come in and then they, they maybe do a class and then, oh, they're going somewhere. So then they don't, they do in the class and they're very inconsistent. And then after maybe a three month trial or something, they're gone. Mm-hmm. And I wish that I could kind of figure out before they started, because I'm afraid that those people, those children may not try it again. I mean, we've had kids come and try it. You know, they, we had them as three-year-olds or four-year-olds and I come back as eight-year-olds or whatever. But I wish we could have a way, I don't know if anybody else out there has um, something that, that could help to ascertain whether or not this is something that the parents really want them to do. Because at that point, the child's having fun in class. There's never been an issue with the, the child not wanting to be there, but the parent has to drive them. So if the parents get busy and do something else, or if they don't see this child doing, you know, whatever, after three weeks, um, you know, how can we, how can we, what, what questions can we ask to say, all right, this is a commitment. This is a training. It's not, you know, a one-time, like going to the movies and then not going the next week or something. So if anybody has any ideas, I'd love well, to hear. Well, the, the only... The only thought that comes to mind is when you pose that question, instead of making it open-ended, where mm-hmm. people are trying to get out of that task as quickly as possible, maybe it's you th- You think of the, because you probably know, we could probably brainstorm a list of the top mm-hmm. seven or eight reasons that someone might want to put a young student in class mm-hmm. and make them rank them on, you know, one to five. Mm-hmm. How important is it for your kid to... Mm-hmm you know, learn self-defense. If they think, if they want their three-year-old learning self-defense, then, you know, maybe there's a conversation that needs to happen, right? Or if it's, if it's for fun, that to me sounds like they're looking for daycare. Right. 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 So if you, if you can list those things out and you make them rank, you know, one to five or one to three or important, Mm -hmm. not so important, 
Yeah, you know, we do so- have them on the bottom of the um, of the application or the, uh, the questionnaire. Um, and it says, you know, circle. And there's quite a list. There's a list of like a dozen things. Focus, you know, better self-control. And they'll circle, you know, whatever. I mean, some people will say all of the above and circle right. it. But, but that's, but sometimes that's a non-answer, person, right? Yeah. So if you pull out the ones that you know are, pro- are that certain answers result in likely problematic students and, and mm-hmm. parental relationships, that's where I, I'd get really specific on you know, making them provide some data for each one, you know, right. force so them, how, force them how to do How important it. is this for you? Something you know, like most, that. What's the most important, like one, two, which they could do right on that form, just, you know, list them um, priority. And then as it goes down or something like that, and then it gives us some that would help because it would give us something to hold. You know, you, you told us that you wanted focus was number one. I've seen your child develop over the past three months, much better focus. Is it carrying over into the home life or the daycare? Or Or if focus is really important for them, but that child is not being brought to every class, they're making it to 50% of classes. Well, now you're providing the mixed signals. It's really important that when you go to class, you you pay really strong attention, Mm -hmm. but yet you're you're telling your child that this thing is not actually important because they're only here half the time. Do not bring it, yeah. Yeah. And and that's, you know, I, I don't care how old the kid is. They're going to pick up on that. Yeah. Yeah. True. True. Yeah. So there I was wanna... another another thing that I was thinking about today because mm. you just get my today thoughts because I can't remember I what it. I was thinking about yesterday. Oh, so, well, you know, I mean, clearly we're having no problem keeping <laughs> this yeah, thing no, going. So by, by all means, keep no. rolling. Well, I was thinking about the word traditional mm. and I have, you know, many people that I meet either at tournaments or wherever, wherever we're involved with, you know, um, other martial artists and they use the word traditional as it has to be traditional. Your martial arts have to be traditional. And I thought about it today, just it popped into my head and I thought about it and I said, well, traditional, the word, the root word is tradition. And who makes traditions? People. And some traditions are carried on and some are changed and some are thrown out. I'm sure in everybody's family, they've had traditions. Friday night, pizza and beer. Well, the kids don't drink the beer, but, you know, Hopefully Friday not. night. <laughs> well, Maybe in Europe. Well, mine, <laughs> I sneak behind the chair. Get out of here. You know, so, but maybe that will change. Mm-hmm. Um some traditions are good. Some traditions probably aren't good. And But when we use the word traditional, I thought about it. And I thought, okay, how, what does that mean to me? I said, well, you know, we study Shaolin Kung Fu with, and I will say Shir, Shirfu, Shady Chung from China, and um, Sifu um, Jeffries, Scott Jeffries from Rockland. That's how he introduced us to Shirfu. Mm-hmm. And, and Mark's been to China f- several times. I've been once, but he's come over here. And he teaches us these wonderful Shaolin forms. Mm. And yes, they are traditional. I mean, these forms have been the same, taught the same way for hundreds of years. Okay. I would never disrespect that form. I would never change it. I would do it as best as I could to the way he wants it done. Because that's respecting that tradition. It's traditional. Mm-hmm. But then you say, but men created these forms and there's so many, there's only so many ways the human body can move. There's Mm -hmm. only so many things that really are effective, like get out of the way. That's effective, you know? Um, And I thought about it and I thought, well, you need to find a school that has strong tradition, but it doesn't have to be traditional. Mm. And I don't know if that's, that might just be, you know, no, I, words, but I like it. I, I I see where you're going. You know, with that, there's a there's a mental exercise I I did not too long ago, and I, I think when we when people say we go, that's not traditional, what what are they really saying? They're saying yeah. that's not the way I would do it. I don't think right. that's right. But instead of me owning that and saying I don't believe what you're doing is appropriate because of my own personal whatevers. Mm-hmm. I'm going to try to find some objective third party argument to discredit what you're doing. Right. Now, right. really, what happens if if everything remains traditional in the way that that's meant? Martial arts actually gets worse 
Mm -hmm. Because that means if it's going to be traditional, I can't do it any differently than my instructor did it. I can only do it in the way that they've done it. And it becomes incredibly difficult to get better than my instructor if I'm trying to do everything as my instructor has done it. And if we carry that out generationally, martial arts gets worse. Mm -hmm. Who wants martial arts to get worse? And I really like the differentiation that you're making between tradition and traditional because a tradition can be established anytime. We've been doing that for five years. Yeah, yeah. Great. If it means something, but if something is traditional, it suggests that old is better. Old Mm -hmm. isn't always better. That's so exactly. We have much better methods for physical development, for Mm -hmm. learning material. The Mm -hmm. way you've you've seen the way that I teach forms. I can teach anybody a form in about Mm -hmm. 10 minutes. Yeah. Yep. And it's completely untraditional. Right. (laughs) But it works really well. Well, with what we know now, um, like I said, I did a lot of um, brain research and classes, Mm -hmm. you know, um, after my master's. And we've learned so much about how people learn and how the brain um, adapts and changes and the elasticity of the brain and Mm. things like that. So, I mean, we need to look at our tradition or traditional things, or look at our tradition and say, does it fit? You know, how can it be made better? Or what can, we always want to evolve. We always want to grow. And I think by, I use the word open mind and, and everybody thinks they have an open mind. I've never met anyone who said, I'm closed-minded. I don't have an open mind. And I want to say, I beg to differ. You do. Um, but I, I'll use that term, open mind. Mm. And so like your your programs that you have with uh, free training day and all in weekend and meeting people of all different levels, all different styles, you learn and you go, wow, well, that's similar to this, but I like that application. I never thought of that, you know, and you learn, you learn this. Now, if I just stick stuck with traditional and said, all right, let's say, because we we had a background in Kempo. I got up to my fifth degree in Kempo. Mm -hmm. Um, So if I said, okay, so I just take these forms and that's fine. You can teach the forms and keep them the same. That's fine. But when you start to pull them apart and look at applications, it's not just like the first school I was in, we never did applications. We just did forms. And then even following it up with a couple other instructors I had, we didn't do applications. We just, you know, we did the form. And then when we did an application, it was only what the instructor saw in that form. And we weren't encouraged because I'd be like all over, you know, I'd be like, oh yeah, but look, that could be this and it could be a grab. And then if when you do this and then go, no, 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 stop, stop. And it would only be taught. So does that take us back to traditional applications? No, I don't think so. I think it's just the way that person and they wanted you to only do it that way, you know. But it's often hidden behind that word. Well, right. this is the traditional way. We look. This is the way we do it. This is the right. correct way. Right. Well, it's right. your way. Yeah. yeah. Why does that have to be my way? I'm never going to be. That's where we the... get into trouble with different yeah. people saying my style is better than yours. You know, my whatever is better. Oh, I could, you know, whatever you want to look at, mm. sparring techniques, whatever. They'll and they'll they'll say it's my style is better. This it's not the style that's better. It's the person, if the person is really good, you know, you say, well, yeah, you're just really good at that. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, but it's not the style that's better. It's not their tradition that's better. Um, it might be the person. So, you know, keeping that open mind and, and letting all that light come in. That's what I feel. I feel like, oh, this is so cool. You know, I do see things, you know, you go to a tournament and you see somebody carrying a sword under their arm with a blade up and in a form. I if I was the judge, I'd have a problem with that. Um, so you do see some things that you think, you know, that could be fixed a little bit better or or they don't have a blade line and they're doing something and things just kind of whipping around and they they win. And I'm like, really? Um, but other than that, and that's more, um, people just aren't aware, I guess, of, mm-hmm. of some of the finer uh, points of, of things. Um, but anyway, so that was my thought for today, the tradition versus traditional and I think as long as you go to a school where your instructors are always training and always seeking 
and always searching and curious, you'll be fine. Yeah. You got, but you have to have that. There's, there's something that, you know, we, we've talked about it on this show forever. This idea that ego really is the the biggest damage sure done is. to the arts. And, and when someone says, you know, well, you know, I'm just, I'm working on this material and that's mm-hmm. the only material they've ever worked on. And now they've risen up to the point where they're the only person keeping that material and they don't have an instructor because their instructor passed away and nobody, nobody could possibly help them get any better. That's where I, mm-hmm. I think, I think it starts to become really unfortunate because they can't get it's better. Sad. Maybe they can refine, yeah. but what they're what they're modeling to their students is whether or not they use the words as you said this is the best thing mm-hmm. well this other thing over here could be really valuable and you get two people you get generally two responses if they're questioned mm-hmm. well you know we have an answer to that or or, or you know this is in here you, you don't need that you know which mm-hmm. is fear fear of stepping out and trying that new thing over there Definitely. Yeah. or it becomes you know, so some kind of, well, you know, once you've mastered this, then go do that, which is really kind of the same thing with it, with yeah. a different face. And it's, it's ego, which is really just fear. It is ego. It, it, well, I like how you say, because I do believe it's fear. I believe it's fear and insecurity. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're secure in your own being and, you know, these things don't, but, you know, and it's in a student, questions i say hey we'll try that we'll go try some kung fu or something or go try this or do whatever or hey maybe let me see if we can you know work something out and do um we'll take that form and we'll do put a weapon in your hand and you can do it with a weapon let's see how that works and you know there's always and i and i do think it's fear and it's kind of funny because when i think about the all the um past instructors and people that i've worked with the ones that were the most fearful and they therefore had this ego right up front because that's their protection. That's their mm. shield. The ego's their shield. Were the big guys. They were the big guys, the big strong guys, the big guys that you'd think would be, you know, like like the rock and be, you know, confident and great. Um, and then when I look and I say, oh, but some of these other people who I think had more challenges getting to where they mm. are, you know, getting to the point that they are. They were the ones that were open-minded and, you know, very open to learning and helping and things like that. So I think that you're right. We, we go back to ego all the time. Um, it's really unfortunate because I didn't see it so much, even in my equestrian uh, life. Um, I showed and I did other things, you know, um, was on a, a drill team and it wasn't like that. People didn't, they it just didn't have the ego wasn't out there. And I mean, I knew and met, you know, Olympic athletes and they were like, cool. You know, they weren't, they weren't, well, get out of my way. My horse is better than yours or something, you know? Well, so what is it? Why? I, I think because inherent value, value, I'm using air quotes in the martial arts, we point to something that is quite subjective rank in the yeah. equestrian world. How would you determine who the best was it's, it's how they show themselves right? they have to it prove themselves every time right there, there it was it was competitive based it was yeah. maybe maybe it's subjective but at least it's all out there for everyone to see right and if you're not willing to show up if you just walk around the bar and saying i'm so much better i've been doing this for 40 years <laughs> i you know if, if i it wouldn't even be fair for me to compete today none of you would have a chance or would be like yeah right yeah whatever. right <laughs> Um, you could make the same argument in, you, you said, o- Olympic athletes, you know, mm-hmm. take a, take out the martial arts. You know, there's no bobsledder who's walking around the Olympic barn going, it, it, you know what? It is unfair for me to compete. I am. I'm just I'm, I'm so just good. so good. Um, I'll let you all go. And just everybody should understand that if I went, you know, I would win. Mm-hmm. But in martial arts, we. Even within the culture of those who compete, there's there's almost this this um, I don't know what to call it this this aversion to the thing that those folks even do, where they dismiss 
competition to say, well, you know, the, in, in, in those rules, you know, and that's not really, those aren't really good rules, right? And that's where you see, you know, MMA arguing against point sparring, arguing against right. continuous, arguing against kickboxing, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's mm -hmm. this, there's this uh, inner debate about the purposes of competition. And so the most people are just completely separate to that. We don't even need to do that. I don't do that. That's that's not what I do. I don't like that. And so you have something that is wholly subjective held up as the standard and the subjective standards don't work. They don't work. They don't work. They don't work at all. Yeah. Well, that takes care of that. Yeah. And so that yeah. leaves so, folks like you I, and I, I but I'm in the just back fascinated. of the room wearing white belts. Yeah, there you go. Happy, happy, to, happy to learn. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I'm... I'm yeah. We've been training for roughly the same amount of time, and and mm -hmm. and I don't think you're any different for me. Somebody has something to teach. I I want to learn it. Oh, I want to learn I don't it. Care. I don't care what it is. I don't care who they. I don't care. And, and and let's face it, when you've been training for decades, and and you know next year will be forty years for me. When you've been training forty years, it's a lot easier to find people who've been training less time than more time. Right. Oh, definitely. So if my standard is this person has to have more time in, mm -hmm. and more stripes, that's not a very large that's group. Not, no. That's that's depressing. It is. I want to learn as much as possible from as many people as possible, not from like these four people who fit this, this mold that I've built for the only people who are worth learning from check all of these boxes. And, you know, there's one of them in, I don't know, Bozeman, Montana. <laughs> and if I can ever make time, I'll go and I'll do a residency for six yeah. months. And until then, you know, everybody just has to accept that I'm as good as I'm going to be. That's that's yeah, so silly you, and wasteful. Because you know, ah. yeah, you know, you learn more from your students yes. than they learn from you. I mean, quantitatively, I learn so much because I see, and I don't mean in technique necessarily, but I see if a student is having difficulty with a technique, you step back and you say, now, why are they? Hmm. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. let me explain it this way or show it this way right. or whatever. Now, that person has actually taught me something. Right. It doesn't matter. And I learn, I learn things all the time from my peers and from, from, and it doesn't matter your belt, you know? Um, but I don't think, I don't think I came into it. I think I have a, a healthy ego because everybody has an ego. Mm -hmm. You know that. Um, and I think I have a healthy ego. And I, I think I have something to share about the way to do things like what, like running a business, things like that. You know, I have ideas or education, you know, I have ideas about child growth and development and say, okay, no, at this age, they're not crossing the midline readily. So let's do this. But I don't have all the answers. So I still am going back to, so why did these really big guys with all these stripes on their belt walk into that? dojo you know on the floor cross their arms and say front kicks go and and have this never showing us anything I, i'm still it, it it baffles me i still think that that was like wow um why why are because, they like that because if they do that nothing they do is ever wrong oh i guess yeah because they haven't so so i I've, I've spent a lot of time unpacking this theory and i think i've shared it once on the show but i i'm i'm fairly confident where i've gotten and i'm, I'm curious your thoughts on this. There is a, an archetype of martial artist, someone who starts probably in their teens, okay. maybe as late as early 20s, and physically, they just excel. Mm -hmm. it, it becomes, maybe they had other sports, or maybe they didn't, but for whatever reason, they just fall in love with martial arts, and they get really good really fast. Okay. And maybe the way that manifests is they compete Quite mm -hmm. often, it's that they compete and they do exceedingly well, yeah. Yeah. and they finally have this thing that they can point to that makes them feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. And they say, "Okay, I, I'm I'm good at this." And they progress through rank fairly quickly. And probably mid to late twenties, they have their own school, and they're they're probably as good, if not better than they used to be with their physical skills mm -hmm. and the, their students come in and maybe they compete a bit, but at the very least they have pictures on the wall of mm -hmm. their, their former exploits and there are trophies mm -hmm. all over. And that instructor becomes much, much lauded, celebrated, praised for what they have done in their physical abilities. But as their students start to get better, 
they start to pull back. Right. Okay. Because they've raised really good students because they are very good themselves mm-hmm. and they're probably at least decent at teaching what mm-hmm. makes them really good. And so their students are good now and they say, wait a second, I don't want to lose face in front of my students because the whole culture of this school is that I am the best and it's I am the untouchable. The pinnacle. Yeah. And I, I can't, I can't show that I'm, I'm fallible. Yeah. That so that, that's when they're saying, you know, they're not demonstrating the form. They're making somebody else demonstrate the form. Right. right. Well, you've got to, you've got to fix this. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, well, how does that, well, just, just do that part. Oh, mm-hmm. you know what? Forget it. You're not ready. Not showing it, mm-hmm. but as they age, you know, forties, fifties, sixties, their physical skills are because not, not yeah. only are they, is their physical body aging, mm-hmm. which is inevitable. <laughs> Kind of, kind of can't get around that. But <laughs> I saw now, the cane you brought in. <laughs> but now, now they they're not even putting in the time. They're not practicing as much with other people. The very things that they could do to remain better longer, right. they're not doing. And they start to realize, okay, I've built this whole system that is dependent on me being perceived as untouchable, mm-hmm. and I know I'm not anymore. Yeah. So yeah. I have to do everything I can to hold on to yeah. that. So there's the fear aspect of this. It's it's yeah. fear of of looking fallible. Yeah. And the other piece I think is really important in there is that as they come through their teens, 20s, even 30s, they generally have an instructor. And that instructor lets them get away with all this. Mm-hmm. Instead mm-hmm. of recognizing, you know what, this person's turning into a bit of a putz. Yeah. So you have, and I should hold them accountable, and I should say, yeah. "Wait a second. Yeah, your physical skills are great, but you're starting to become a jerk, and mm-hmm. we need to talk about that." Mm-hmm. They let them go with it, mm-hmm. and it becomes a a pattern. Okay. And the the young buck, and it's almost always mm-hmm. a guy, right? Yeah. You know. Yeah, when, I don't know any this, girls that I ever had. We see, well, we see, you know, the the senior student who is, is quite good and goes mm-hmm. off and sees competitive success. And they get to a point where they want more mm-hmm. and they're not being modeled with more. They're being modeled with ego. Ego, yeah. And so they've been pumped up that competitive success means that you're the best in the world. And there's usually some argument. It's, it's generally about rank or money. And mm-hmm. now they split. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I watch it happen generation after generation. And if it happens in one school, you can usually watch it fall down the line. Yep, absolutely. I've seen it. I've seen it myself. So yeah. what we're saying is that actually in this, the way you presented it is that the, the ego heavy, top heavy person was created, created by not being called, you know, like, hey, you're being a jerk. You know, yeah, you know, yeah you, you're good at that. But you know what? Let's sit down and uh, do a, a math problem or something. Um, you know, so the person was allowed to develop that way, yeah. and then real and got to a point where you you are going to slow down. I mean, I in my brain, I can do everything that I could do at thirty five. I started when I was thirty five, so I've been training for thirty five years because mm-hmm. I'm seventy, and my brain says, "Okay, jump spinning back." You know, do yeah, yeah. And I can show it and do it, but it's certainly not going to be, you know, I'm not kicking the top of the bag or whatever. Um, But you have to realize that that's going to happen. I don't hesitate showing it. And I will tell my students, you can do better than that. I'm going to show you how to do it. But now, and, you know, Tashi Mark's the same way, but now you can do it because you're young, you're flexible, you've got those quick twitch muscles going and you're, you know, and they're fine with it. They're fine with it. Nobody has to be the perfect, do everything perfectly. You don't have to, as long as you can explain it and show, and then you have someone, you know, we have someone in class and say, oh, I know you did a great job with that kick. Would you please demonstrate? I would go even further to say that there is nothing that better supports a, a, a learning environment in the martial arts than instructor who is willing to not be perfect in front of their mm-hmm. students. Yeah, absolutely. If you can look at your instructor and say, wow, my instructor, yeah, they do that better than me, but actually I do that thing over there better <laughs> than them. Yeah. And they're okay with that. Mm-hmm. 
How great is that? How freeing is that for your students that they don't have to hold themselves to a perfect standard? Right. You can't that's be perfect. You will be. I mean, that's <laughs> exactly. And I've, you know, there, there's an example that comes to mind. I never voice this publicly. Uh, and I always remove as much detail so nobody could ever track it back. But there was mm-hmm. a circumstance where I saw a higher ranking instructor who I had never seen do a form. Wow, yeah. And I caught them doing a form and I was watching. It was beautiful. And I was so wow. in awe watching. And as soon as they saw I was watching, they stopped wow. and walked away. Because they were afraid they weren't going to be perfect? I, I suspect now. And I, at the time, I didn't quite know. Hmm. I was younger. I was in my late 20s. Yeah. But when hmm. I think about that circumstance now and, and hmm. knowing that person a bit better, I think that's what it was. They didn't want to mess up. They didn't want to look yeah. imperfect. They were probably trying to work something out. They weren't just mm-hmm. practicing for the sake of killing time. They were they were practicing. Yeah, yeah. They were trying to get themselves yeah. better. Yeah. I thought it was beautiful. Oh. To watch that process of someone getting better at something, I think is amazing. Mm-hmm. I, I love mm-hmm. watching that. I don't care whether it's mm-hmm. martial arts or archery or Any. equestrian yeah. events or yeah. building a house. You know, mm-hmm. I love watching people get better at things. That's something that's mm-hmm. really inspiring to me and I think to most people. Yeah, well, I I think it opens up the teacher-student relationship um, as far as them trusting you, too. Because the more they know, I mean, again, going way back when I first Mm -hmm. started, the instructor, you didn't, you know his name, and that was it. You didn't know where they live, what kind of background, you know, did they go to school? Did they go to college? Did they, are they married? Did they have children? Um, you didn't know anything, and that was that was purposely designed that way. That you it was really weird when you saw them at the grocery store wearing jeans. Oh God! Well, I I usually get that, but you know what they say to me when they, they see they'll see me and go, "I've never seen you with clothes on," and all the people in the whole store go, "Yep." What it's it's one of my favorite mean? martial arts isms because we all know what it means <laughs> and nobody else does. Nobody and else does. It's, and they it's all the look funniest like horror, thing. Like this, child especially if it's a kid. Like, yeah, if it's a kid saying that to you. Whew. But it's the idea of trust with, um, you know, if, how can you trust someone who you really only know their name and you never see them do anything and they just stand up like in the front of the class as a figurehead and tell you what to do. Okay, take your hand, do this, and you're going to da da um, I, I always felt like I, I couldn't trust the person mm-hmm. because they weren't a real person. You know, they weren't real to me. And I think that's so important that you have to, we talk, go back to the culture, developing the culture of your school. Mm. You have to be real. You have to make mistakes. You have to have bad days, even though you don't let it affect your teaching on the, on the floor. You know, you leave it, leave it behind, but you, you know, um, we don't share everything, but if someone asks me a question, I answer it truthfully, you know, and, and, they get to know, well, do you, do you have animals? Well, yeah, I have chickens now. You know, we always had chickens, but I don't have any horses anymore. Um, and we start to talk and then you, you start to develop that camaraderie and you, and they, oh, I have chickens too. Have you had a, yeah. have trouble? Are they not laying right now? Because mine are holding back. Um, I got one egg today. That was it out of 20 chickens. Um, so do they need more light. Yeah, we, yeah, that's usually it. And they molted. So I, oh, you know, I know you why it is, but, but, you know, you'll have that relationship. And, and so when people say, I, I want to build a better culture, be yourself, mm. be, you know, who are you and be you and with all your, you know, foibles and, you know, you might, um, I don't know, have the school might not be as clean as you would like, or, I don't, or they don't get back to you right away with the email. I don't know, but you have to be yourself and just, and, and then people start to, they'll trust you. And if you don't have trust, and I'll tell people that because when they're trying so hard, the new students, and they're trying so hard and they're trying to get it right. And they say, oh, again, I said, trust me, you're doing fine. This will all come out. You just have to trust us, follow the, the program, you know, just, just don't worry about it. And when they relax and do that, they go, oh, you're right. Okay, I see. And they, you know, so that would yeah. be my, yeah, be yourself. You well know. said. Uh, yep, yep. Well said. So what's next 
for you. And I know you, I know you spend a lot of time oh. training and teaching, mm-hmm. and I know you're mm-hmm. enjoying it. Or at least I assume you're enjoying it just based on yes, the, for the, the most part, the I think expression yeah. I see on your face and photos <laughs> yeah. and the times yeah. I've been yeah. there. Yeah. But what's next? You know, if you look out over the next few years, okay, what's coming for you? I mean, I have, uh, you know, I have dreams. I have, I've designed. You know, I always I designed a beautiful school. You know, architecturally on paper, mm-hmm. things like that. And I thought, it, well, if I ever got a windfall or a lottery or something like that, because it's a multi-million dollar building, um, have to buy land. So I'm, you know, I'm always thinking about how do we bring the art, and I truly believe it's an art, mm-hmm. to more people. And really, I mean, I, I think everyone should train. I mean, I just, I so believe that. And, and that's kind of what I like. How can we do this? How can we? So I'm out in the community. You know, I'm in Rotary. I work at the, both the schools. I do the elementary schools. I do things. How, how can we? That's my, my goal. immediate goal is just to kind of um, try to, to bring the art to more people. Um, I do counsel on aging, um, self-defense. I do just finished a program at one of the um, elementary schools. Um, just to kind of, and I really try to spread the joy. I, I think mm. uh, when I go in to do these programs, I want people to understand that this is, it's fun. It's joyful. It's, it's, this is a good time. You can have a good time. It's not work. It's a good time. It's fun. And, and try to get them in. And so I have that kind of that idea of how do we bring the school to the next level? Um, you know, so I can use advice because I know you're great with, with Mark and Thank advice. You. And, you know, personally, um, people will ask me, they'll say, well, how long are you going to do that Kung Fu stuff? Uh, my mother, when I first started, okay, she's she's been gone like 25 years now or whatever. But she said, why are you doing that Kung fu stuff? And I said, well, mom, it's karate because that's what it was at the time. And it's not, but, you know, and, and she was like, didn't understand and, um, you know, but I want to make personally, when people ask me, how long are you going to do this? I say forever because I'm afraid to stop. Mm. I know what it does for me. And I know when I go for my checkup, my doctor will say, whatever you're doing, don't stop because you're 70 years old. I got you down here for, you know, physically 50, 45 you know, all your, your blood work and everything or whatever. I know I have a lot of wrinkles and everything, but, um, so I think, oh my God, I don't want to stop. I mean, that would be like stopping to take new, you know, food or something like that. How long are you going to eat healthy? How long are you going to exercise? How long are you going to have a positive outlook onto the world? Like, like why wouldn't you do a thing that works so well for you? Well, I think I think you sometimes you question. Sometimes you say, "Am I spending too much time on sure. one aspect of my life?" And it's become you know a big part of my life, but it it affects everything. You know, mm. it, it my health, my my spirituality, everything, my friendships, socially. Um, but every once in a while, you do step back. I love to paint. I love mm. art. That was my minor in college, okay. um, and my master's was in creative arts, and so I love that, but I don't have really to have the, I have some time, but I don't have the inspiration. And mm. to, to really do your art, you need to have the inspiration. And to put that easel, you know, the, the, the canvas on the easel and just say, okay, I'm going to spend some time now. I do have an inspiration. I haven't, you know, that's kind of frustrating. I would like to ride again. I haven't mm. ridden in years. That's something I would like to do. So I say, how do I work that in? Um, with a sword, with a, with a sword, what? you just ride with a sword. <laughs> no, the sword I, think the, yeah. I think the Practice rest of it my, will figure yeah, itself out. Yeah, just ride say, around with a sword, yeah. chop things. I, I don't, I don't know what yeah, it looks like, but I'll get it back sounds to like a great table time. And they'll say that horse had a head when you left. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Oh, well, that was, uh, that was the number six strike. I think that did that. Um, so I don't know for me, I just kind of, I have a lot of things I want to do. I, and I love to travel. Mm. You know, and that's been nice as far as the martial arts goes, because when we were doing all the tournaments, I mean, we were in Bermuda, Quebec a lot, um, Jamaica, um, you know, travel, China, mm-hmm. traveled around. And so I'd like to do that more. 
I think everybody would like to travel more. I mean, that's Aruba. Yeah. Love Aruba. Um, you know, the Southwest is one of the places I love to go. And I, but there's nothing like going out onto the desert and doing your forms. Mm. It's just, it, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, it's, you just, I can't explain it, but it's, um, you know, it's just a wonderful thing. So, and that, and just, you know, stay healthy, um, spread the love as best we can. And I think that's what it comes down to. Um, be a good role model for my grandchildren. You know, I have mm -hmm. four. And uh, one, the three and a half year old uh, Ruby trains here, um, you know, and just kind of enjoy life, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what it is. And, and I always feel that, I mean, I have, I've been very, very lucky, very, very lucky in my life. And I think of the times that, you know, you could take a wrong turn and you didn't, you took the right turn. And who told you to take that right turn? I don't know, but I did. And so I've been just, you know, extremely fortunate. Sure. So. And how do we end today? What, what words do you want to leave the listeners? Oh, with? you could sing a song. Well, you could sing a song. This is <laughs> this is your this is your episode. Not, if you I'm want to sing, sing a song, song. I'll, I'll, <laughs> by all means. Yeah, the Eensy I'm not going to come in with any accompaniment though. I could do the Eensy Weensy Spider. I've done that enough. The Wheels on the Bus. The Wheels on the Bus is a yes. big hit with all the, the grandkids. Um, how do we end? I think we end. We're approaching. You know, we're in the holiday season. Um, and it's a time when I think people can maybe take a few moments to step back and reflect. And I'd like anyone listening that does not train, which I'm not sure your audience, probably most people are involved already it's, in the, martial arts. Yeah, just, but we actually, there, there's a decent demographic, and, and I hear this via email, so maybe mm -hmm. this is helpful, of folks who used to train. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yes, yes. That is something that I think is very interesting. And I, that could be a whole session to talk mm. about that because there's so many, they give you reasons why they stopped and you can take those at face value. And most of them were, you know, time, rarely money. I mean, parents of children will say, well, we, we, I don't think we can afford it or whatever, but, but I'm thinking about adults or people who have left maybe in their teens and twenties and thirties or whatever. So it's usually time there they change jobs and, you know, or they had children and now they're taking care of their children. So you look at that and we've had a, a lot of people have said, I, 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 I miss it so much. I want to get back. And I'd say to them, do it. Just put your foot through that freaking door, walk in, no cost, take, take the class, rediscover why you loved it because it will happen and take it from there but it's just getting them back through the door to actually start training again and you know mo i mean people say i love i can't wait to get back i had a, a woman just the other day and she said i'm retiring in a year i will be back i can't wait i will be back i'm retiring in a year and i said okay mary please you know please do because you you loved it and you know how good it was for you. And I mean, people talk about stress through really, all this stuff. And I don't throw that out there all the time because everybody's stressed, I guess. But it's so true that come back, come back and, and train. And if you've never trained, walk through that door, find a school, talk to people. I think that's a good way to get a, a sense of if the school might be a good fit. Talk to your friends because if they're your friends, you probably think alike a little bit, you know. So if you have friends that train, talk to them and say, you know, why do you like that school? And is it something you think I should do? And go as their buddy and, uh, you know, give it a go because we only have one go around as far as I know. I don't know. I've been kind of toying with reincarnation, but I'm not sure if that, anyway, that's another discussion, but, <laughs> but we only have one, one chance at this. And I know there's so many wonderful things to do in the world. I mean, as I said, I've loved, you know, skiing and riding and all kinds of things. Um, but there's nothing like this. There's nothing like the martial arts, period. End of story. I had a lot of fun with today's conversation. Getting the chance to talk philosophy and, and ego and all these other deeper and I think incredibly important conversations within the martial arts world really makes me happy. It's something that I enjoy doing. And not every guest wants to go there, but 
Tashi Deb wanted to go there. So we went there and I had a blast doing it. Hope you enjoyed the conversation as well. Tashi Deb, thank you. I'll talk to you soon. I appreciate you. Listeners, viewers, head to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out all the stuff going on over there. Photos, links, and all the good stuff. Now, if you have a martial arts school, in addition to joining the Patreon and being in the School Owners Mastermind, we offer consulting. If you want to take my skills that I've used to help grow Whistlekick, to build our reach, to getting us access to the top martial artists in the world, if you want access to all that skill, but direct it in a way to help your martial arts school grow with integrity and with an eye towards cost, and we're not going to burn your budget in the first two weeks, let me know. All you have to do is email me. We'll get started. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. If you don't want to start that way, we have a page at whistlekick.com. Just go to the school owners tab and you'll see a ton of information there on how we work. And we do have a few slots open right now. That may change by the time you hear this episode. Who knows when you're listening to it. But if you're a school owner, you should be working with someone. And I don't think there's anybody better than our team. So let me know. I could also come out. We could teach seminars at your school. Bring one of the Matic teacher training programs to your school or your area. Lots of good stuff that we're doing. Sharing. Building our industry. Talk to me. Let me know. Let's do it together. Again, my email is jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick everywhere you can think of. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 